Uh, hi, I'm Scott Sumner of Bentley University. And the reason I'm speaking to you today is that uh, for the last two years I've been doing a blog called themoneyillusion.com. And it's attracted some attention because I've presented a rather unconventional view of the recent economic crisis. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that I'm doing an unconventional take on a crisis using very conventional economic theories and tools. Uh, for instance, I'm going to be assuming the efficient market hypothesis holds, and in fact that it's a very useful way of understanding what went wrong in 2008. And I'm going to argue that almost everybody was wrong about the crisis. There was a sort of a general understanding that what went wrong was there was a severe economic crisis and uh, a recession followed. Instead, I'm going to argue that it was actually contractionary monetary policy that was the biggest cause of the recession. This is a quotation from Robert Hall in a recent symposium on the economic crisis. It's the first four sentences of his article leading off. And I think it pre presents sort of a consensus view of, of what happened. Notice he starts off talking about the Great Depression, worst financial crisis in history, followed by a depression, and then makes a comparison to 2008. Actually, what happened is almost exactly the opposite. In the Great Depression, the depression started long before the first severe financial crisis, which was late 30 and 1931. So you can make a better argument that the causation went the other direction. The Great Depression was actually the cause of the subsequent banking and international exchange crises. Now I'm going to argue that something similar happened in 2008. It's a little harder to make the case in this uh, time period because there definitely was a subprime mortgage crisis in 2007, but in retrospect it was actually fairly mild. And even as far as mid-2008, the U.S. economy and the global economy were still in decent shape. Unemployment was at a fairly reasonable level. And if you look at the next slide here, uh, you'll see that real GDP declined, this is monthly estimates by the way, declined very sharply from June to December 2008. And the financial crisis that Robert Hall was talking about, he mentioned the fall of 2008, that's post Lehman Brothers failure. That actually occurred about halfway through this decline in real GDP. In the next slide, we see that nominal GDP also followed a similar pattern. Uh, now, why is nominal GDP so important? That's the total dollar value of income in the economy. And if you think about it, most debts are contracted in nominal terms. So, in a sense, the economy's dollar income is a, a good metric for measuring people's ability to repay these previously contracted nominal debts. Whenever there's a severe break in nominal GDP growth or a drop in nominal GDP, you almost invariably get some sort of debt crisis. This happened in the early 1930s when nominal GDP fell in half. And again, in 2008, 2009, we saw the biggest year-over-year -year drop in nominal GDP since 1938. So what I'm going to argue basically is that this was primarily a failure of monetary policy and the intensification of the financial crisis in late 2008 was due to this failure of monetary policy. I will not argue that the Fed is to blame for the original subprime crisis. That would have happened anyway. I'm going to argue instead that the Fed made the crisis much worse. And when I say the Fed, I'm also talking indirectly about central banks throughout the developed world, including the European Central Bank and the Bank of Japan. Now, what's the conventional wisdom on monetary policy? Well, you'd think it's what we teach in our most popular textbooks. Frederick Mishkin has the number one money textbook, at least in the United States. And here's three key principles he uses to sum summarize policy. First, it's dangerous to associate the easing or tightening of monetary policy with a fall or a rise in short-term nominal interest rates. Despite this, almost all economists assume money was very easy in late 2008, mostly because interest rates were low. Second point, you need to look at other asset markets to really understand what's going on with monetary policy. And as we'll see in the next few slides, almost every other asset market was signaling that money was far too tight for the needs of the economy. Third, monetary policy can be highly effective even when interest rates are near zero. Once again, most economists seem to have forgotten this, and during the severe phase of the crisis, there was little discussion of using monetary stimulus, 
mostly because they assumed it couldn't work at near zero rates. Instead, we relied, we relied on fiscal stimulus. Um, by the way, Milton Friedman had this same sort of dismay about misunderstanding the role of interest rates, in this case in Japan. If you look at this quote, he pointed out that ultra-low interest rates are actually a sign money has been very tight, producing deflation and a weak economy and therefore low interest rates. Now some economists will say, okay, nominal interest rates can be misleading, but certainly real interest rates are a useful indicator of monetary policy. Well, in fact, even real interest rates aren't very reliable, but let's say they are. Here's a graph that shows real interest rates from about July to late November 2008. As you can see, and these are on five-year treasury bonds in the United States. As you can see, the real interest rate went from barely over a half a percent to more than 4% in a period of only about five months. So if we are going to argue the real interest rates are the right indicator, money was extremely tight. There was an unprecedented tightening of monetary policy during this period. And yet most economists I talk to don't even know that real interest rates rose sharply in the second half of 2008, which suggests to me that they pay lip service to that, but are really mostly focusing on nominal interest rates. Uh, here's another asset market. Commodity prices fell more than in half in late 2008, again suggesting tight money. Here's the value of the dollar in the foreign exchange market. It rose sharply between July and December 2008 against average of other currencies, again suggesting tight money. And you can go one asset market after another. Stock prices crashed in late 2008. Commercial real estate prices, which had actually done well during the initial decline in residential housing in America, then began falling sharply in late 2008. Residential real estate a weakness in the early years of the subprime crisis had been limited mostly to a few states where a lot of subprime borrowing took place in the Southwest and in Florida. During late 2008, this spread to the heartland of the United States. Places like Texas that had never had a housing bubble in the first place saw, sharp, uh, saw some declines in housing prices. And inflation spreads measured in the uh, Treasury index bond market fell sharply, again indicating tight money. So all of the asset markets were basically signaling money was way too tight for the needs of the economy. Um, now a lot of people talk about the housing bubble as being the cause, not tight money. But I think people misunderstand uh, the nature of housing bubbles. Just because there's been a sharp run up in prices doesn't mean it's inevitable that housing prices are gonna decline in the near future or even the medium term. For instance, this graph shows that uh, in the United States, by 2005, prices had risen very dramatically, even in relative terms, but, and they did decline uh, after 2006. So in that sense, a bubble prediction was correct. But if you'd been in New Zealand, Britain, there would have been almost no change over the next five or six years. And in Australia, prices have gone still higher. So in all four markets, there was a sharp run-up, but that doesn't really provide a reliable indicator of where prices are going next. Uh, again, if you look at housing in terms of sales, construction, almost any indicator, you'll find that in the United States, the market peaked in early 2006. And by April 2008, most of the decline had taken place already in construction, for instance, and yet, Unemployment was still only 4.9% in April 2008 in the United States. The huge increase in unemployment took place afterwards and was associated with a broader decline in aggregate demand all across the U.S. economy, not just housing. This graph shows the role of the decline in nominal spending on the um, position of the banking industry, losses estimated by the IMF. <clears throat> the two dark uh, lines show declines in both real GDP forecasts and inflation forecasts combined for 2009 and 2010, total growth over those two years, declining very sharply between April 2008 and April 2009. These are forecasts from the IMF. And as that occurred, the estimated size of the banking uh, crisis in the U.S. got much bigger from $1 trillion to nearly $3 trillion even though in the earlier period we already knew about the subprime troubles. Then after the forecast started improving after 2000, April 2009, 
the estimated losses started shrinking in the banking sector. So that shows the important role of changes in nominal spending on um, the size of the losses in the banking industry and the role it played in the severe intensification of the crisis in October of um, 2008. So what are some policy implications? The essential, um, the most important thing the Fed can do is to stabilize nominal GDP growth through a policy of targeting the forecast. Uh, now there's several ways this can be done. Lars Svensson had suggested using internal Fed forecasts. And the intuition behind this is really fairly simple. If you're, say, a ship captain aiming for a certain port, you would, you'd want to expect to reach that port. It would make no sense for a captain to say, I'm aiming for uh, Charleston, South Carolina, but I expect to reach Norfolk, Virginia on the current headings and taking into account waves and wind. So your goal of where you want to go and your target, or your, um, I'm sorry, your forecast should be the same. But oddly enough, that's not been true with monetary policy. You have central banks saying we expect a certain inflation rate or a certain nominal GDP growth rate, and yet we actually have a goal that's different from that. Well, that begs the question, why haven't you adjusted the instrument settings of your monetary policy? So that's Lars Svensson's approach. Alternative approach that I've argued for is to create nominal GDP futures markets to let the markets tell us where the economy is likely going and use those as sort of a guidepost for monetary policy. Um, that's the idea of, of targeting forecasts or sort of a future, um, futures approach to policy. In fact, what the central banks have been doing is a backward looking policy, almost like driving a car while looking in the rear view mirror rather than looking down the road. Here's one important example. There was a key Fed meeting in uh, September of 2008. This was two days after Lehman Brothers failed. The Fed decided to leave interest rates unchanged at 2%. Now, if you look at the minutes for the meeting, they decided that there was an equal risk of either recession or high inflation. So they decided not to change interest rates at all. But in fact, the real risk was not high inflation, but low inflation, because on the very day the Fed met, the tips markets were already showing five-year inflation expectations of only 1.23%, which is well below the Fed's implicit 2% target. So if they had been taking a forward-looking approach to monetary policy and targeting the forecast, they would have definitely cut interest rates sharply, pursued a much more aggressive monetary stimulus at that time. Instead, they did nothing. They left interest rates unchanged at 2%. I think almost every economist would say in retrospect, that it would have been better for the Fed to be more stimulative in late 2008, given what we know about hap what happened afterwards. My point is that the markets were already telling us the Fed was off course at that point. It was relying on sort of a central planning approach of trying to decide on its own and not really taking in, into account the signals that the economy was sending about the likely path of the economy. So to summarize, looking forward, the lessons we can learn from this crisis are, first of all, that we need to get past the sort of wait and see approach towards policy, stabilization policy, fiscal and monetary. Too often economists will talk about, well, we'll try some fiscal stimulus and wait and see how it works, or we'll cut interest rates and wait and see what happens to the economy six months later. What we have to do is look immediately at what the asset markets are telling us about the policy stimulus. We should know five minutes after the Fed makes a move how much inflation expectations have moved in the Treasury bond market and whether the stimulus is effective in meeting the Fed's goals, if its goal is, say, to increase inflation a little bit. Uh, second, the markets have been telling us basically since September 2008 that the stimulus has not been effective. Both monetary and fiscal stimulus have not been effective enough to promote a vigorous recovery. So we should have known if we took efficient markets seriously that more stimulus was needed. And finally, I think it's a scandal that the federal government in the United States has not yet created and subsidized trading in a nominal GDP futures market. There's no single indicator that would be more valuable to the Federal Reserve than knowing the expected path of nominal GDP. Contrary to what the press often reports, it's not really inflation that the Fed is targeting it's implicitly nominal GDP. When people say the Fed would like a little more inflation, 
actually what they would like is more nominal spending and they prefer to get more real growth and less inflation for any given boost in demand. So that sort of nominal GDP futures market could provide an invaluable sort of compass for the Fed to navigate the economy uh, in the future. Thank you.